AMD's giant Threadripper CPUs are back. And if you thought their 7950X was overkill, the new 7980X has quadrupled the CPU cores and they go even higher. And look, I love my tiny ITX production system. The 7800X 3D in that thing is coping absolutely fine. But these things are seriously tempting me to build a mega overkill workstation. So let's see what's actually new here and if it's worth it. Now, for the most part, Threadripper 7000 is what a lot of people would expect. It's AMD's high-end desktop lineup using their Zen 4 silicon. So they've taken the Ryzen 7000 cores, crammed even more of them together, and created absolute monsters like this, the 7970X and 7980X. A lot more CPU cores, a bunch more PCIe lanes, and the memory support gets a huge lift as well. They're also quite quite expensive, but it goes without saying that these are for power users that make money with their PCs. If you can just throw money at your PC and it does your job two or three times as fast, there are a lot of professions where that is a no-brainer. Now, there are actually two types of Threadripper for this generation. There's this stuff, which is HEDT for power users like myself, perhaps. These plug into TRX50 motherboards, and then it gets a little bit crazy. And then you have the WRX90 motherboards with even more RAM support, even more PCIe links and those are paired with the Pro Threadripper lineup of CPUs to enable those extra features. It's also worth mentioning though, the 7995WX Threadripper CPU, that thing has an insane 96 cores, and despite it being a Pro CPU, you can still use those CPUs in TRX50 motherboards. So it's kind of cool, but not something that I see a lot of people doing. If you're already buying a Pro CPU, especially the 96 core, you might as well go the full distance. And yeah, if you mainly are just interested in Threadripper for all of those PCIe lanes and the upgraded memory support, you can buy one of the cheaper 12 core models as well. So I guess let's talk about what I have here then. It is an absolute monster. This is the TRX50 Sage from Asus. And yeah, I have to balance it because it is so heavy. But yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. Firstly, the horizontal CPU slot. We first saw this with WRX ATE. Uh, I will mention though, the install method, the mechanism is exactly the same as what you would expect from previous Threadripper generations. We also have the horizontal memory slots. There are four slots here for TRX50. Apparently that is still enough to run up to one terabyte of quad channel memory. And then there's the VRM and these aren't memory dims or anything. This is the VRM, it wraps around the entire CPU socket. So most gaming motherboards have 10 or so power stages. The previous generation TRX40 Zenith Extreme, also from ASUS, had 16 power stages. This thing has 36 power stages, which is just absolutely mental. You can also plug two power supplies into this thing, which is, yeah, that's a first for me when it comes to motherboards. It has two 24 pin connectors and four eight pin connectors just for the CPU, just in case, you know, if you casually want to overclock the 7995WX on this thing and you have an insane amount of cooling. And if you do have a current Threadripper system up and running, it's worth mentioning the CPU cooler mounting is exactly the same. No need to upgrade anything there. So the 14900K and 7950X are brutally fast CPUs. This is the top spec stuff for the consumer desktop right now. But how much faster can we really go with Threadripper? I mean, that's what I'm personally wondering. How much time can I be saving by upgrading to this new platform on the production side of things? Quick look at the test bench, by the way. It is a 1600 watt power supply and a 360 mil liquid cooler. And I've used 6400 megahertz DDR5 with the exact same timings on each platform. I've also made sure to double check the memory controller is running in sync with the memory clock on the Ryzen and Threadripper. Ripper. Thankfully, no issues there, but the Ryzen 7950X wasn't at first. So yeah, something just to double check. There is a capacity difference here, a pretty big one, but it doesn't really make a difference in the workloads that I'm testing because I'm not loading up really big projects. So let's actually start with Cinebench. If you're into 3D work, this will give you an idea of the rendering performance within Maxon Cinema 4D. And yet there are massive gains here for the new Threadripper CPUs. Now, of course, you're also spending a lot more money and the performance per dollar argument doesn't look great here at all. But you know, that kind of all goes out the window when you're able to get twice or almost three times the amount of work done in the same amount of time. Single threaded performance though is not that great. I mean, they actually lose out to the smaller desktop chips, which is kind of unfortunate. I would have at least liked to see them on par with the 7950X since they use the same silicon. The 4900K actually in particular here is really impressive thanks to its massive six gigahertz boost clock. But then again, in V-Ray, rendering on only the CPU, even 
even larger gains than what we saw in Cinebench. And both the 32 core and 64 core are looking pretty good here. The 7970X is giving you some pretty good performance for the money, and the outright performance of the 7980X is super impressive. Switching over to Blender now, we're actually using the pretty recent 4.0 build, and I've got this uh, kind of cool animation here, which looks like this. It's actually one of the demo files, so if you want, you can load this up on your own system. I've used the exact same default settings, so you can kind of compare the performance to what we have here. Something really interesting though is that this runs using the EV renderer, which exclusively runs on the GPU. So yeah, on our 4090 here, it basically takes no time at all. And funnily enough, it's the pairing with the 14900K that comes out on top, because although it's rendering on the GPU, it still uses a single CPU core to handle all of the scheduling and the loading and all of that extra stuff. So yeah, personally, I've found this pretty interesting. Now, if we were to switch from EV to a Cycles project for something that is a bit more photorealistic, something like this, for example, which is like rendering fur, we can then use the CPU. And yet there is actually some pretty insane scaling for Threadripper 7000. The 7980X is roughly three times faster than the 7950 here, you can render in a third of the time or a three times higher resolution or sample count in the same amount of time. Cycles Renderer can still use the GPU though, and that's when things really get put into perspective. Our 4090 is almost three times faster again than the 7980X, and it also costs about $3,500 less. So yeah, GPUs are still king when it comes to rendering, there's no surprises there. Now when we combine both CPU and GPU rendering together, there really isn't much further time saving. I mean, a 7980X build here versus our 7950X build is only around 11% faster. So look, most popular renderers these days can use the GPU, even the new Cinebench 2024, which uses Redshift. For the 3D artists out there, I mean, you'll know whether these CPUs fit into your workflow or not, but generally speaking, you definitely want to max out your budget on your GPU first before even considering working with Threadripper. Video editing is what I'm personally most interested in though, and these had me really curious because quad channel DDR five monstrous amount of CPU cores. I was really hoping that these would be an upgrade. Surprisingly though, they're not. I mean, at least for my workflow, there's not really much time saving to be had. Video export times are basically the same across everything I tested and even rendering on the GPU, which is what I do with H.265, basically the same as rendering on the 7980X or 7970X. Where I did see a difference though is when generating optimized media. So this is something that I do at the end of every edit just so I can color grade and proof watch and add all of those finishing touches without dropping any frames. And the new Threadripper chips are pretty quick at this. I mean, surprisingly, not much scaling beyond the 32 core, but yeah, that 7970X can do this in about 60% of the time of the 7950X. Rendering proxies in Adobe Premiere Pro is a very similar workflow to this. I've tested this before, but here the results are very different. And in fact, it's the 14900K that can complete this faster than anything else. We are rendering QuickTime proxies though, so maybe there are some Intel optimizations here or something like that. Now, when it comes to gaming, uh, yeah, there's not a whole lot to say. Threadripper 7000 can game, but there are some pretty big deficits here to the smaller desktop chips. AMD actually mentioned nothing about gaming for these Threadripper chips, and yeah, it's kind of clear why. I would have loved to see some more optimization here, maybe at least kind of catching up to that 7950X, but yeah, at the moment, they're just okay. All right, now in terms of thermal and power, these are pretty interesting. So the 7970X and 7980X, both of them are capped at 350 watts. Now that is their listed TDP, but it also means that they're not thermally limited like the 7950X, which kind of runs up to 95 degrees and then the power consumption dips to keep things under control. These things never dipped below 350 watts. I mean, the 7970X was close and we are running on an open test bench here with a 360 mil liquid cooler and some pretty high fan speeds, but still, I think that's pretty impressive. The 7980X runs actually even cooler because you now have that same 350 watts spread over more silicon and more cores. There I was seeing full load temps between 65 and 75 degrees at a pretty typical room temperature of 23. So yeah, that's not bad at all for a 64 core CPU. But what about overclocking? Well, the 7970X I actually didn't bother with because it's pretty much at its thermal limit anyway, but the 7980X is where things get really interesting because that thing has like 20 plus degrees left in the tank. So what I'd recommend doing here is just simply unlocking the power limit and current limit in the BIOS, and that's it. I mean, the more time you spend manually tweaking the offsets and stress testing, the more time you're just wasting, and also the more instability you're going to introduce. And for a production system, that just doesn't make any sense at all. 
all. You don't want to be doing a render and then it crashes 90% of the way through just because you wanted an extra 50 megahertz. So I unlocked the power limits on the 7980X and I was not prepared for what I saw next. This thing pulled over 500 watts sustained and it actually spiked up to 650. That is by far the highest power draw that I've ever tested on a CPU. And at this point, we're just limited by temperatures. I'm sure if we had a full coverage water block and a better radiator, we could probably squeeze this thing up to like 700 watts or more. In fact, AMD said themselves, they've had these things running over 800. So unlocking the power limits on the 7980X is worth it. It's good for about a 400 megahertz overclock on average, and we see about a 7.5% bump in both Cinebench and Blender. And again, you could probably get that close to like 9 or 10% gains here with just a full coverage block. I mean, power efficiency kind of gets thrown out the window, but I mean, for time critical renders, I say why not? So it looks like my current production system is not getting replaced anytime soon. And the most important thing for me when it comes to smooth editing and exporting really quickly is a super overkill GPU and Threadripper doesn't really seem to be changing that. Don't get me wrong, I really want to upgrade to Threadripper 7000. I think the TRX50 platform with quad channel memory and everything like that is super interesting. The Threadripper chips themselves as well, you know, there's a lot of performance that is potentially on tap there, but it just doesn't really seem to do anything for my workflow. I mean, if AMD had found a way to like cut my render times in half, then I mean, take my money, I'd be upgrading in a heartbeat. But that is just not the case. So I think if you even have to ask the question whether you should upgrade to Threadripper, then you most likely shouldn't. The people who truly need this hardware pretty much know right away whether it's gonna be worth it. The CPU performance, the memory, or maybe just in terms of the sheer PCIe lanes. In those aspects, Threadripper 7000 is an absolute weapon. These actually go on sale tomorrow. So if you're interested in picking these up, I will leave some links down below in the description. Otherwise, huge thanks for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.